This episode is brought to you by my Fertility Awareness Mastery online self-study program. Learn fertility awareness from the comfort of your own home at your own pace for a fraction of the cost. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash mastery for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash mastery. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 383. Welcome to the Fertility Friday podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. All right, ladies, today I am doing a full throwdown on the topic of low progesterone. I feel like, so last week I released a podcast episode about you know, basal body temperature and the issue of low temperatures and what you can do about it, because that's a question I get a lot. But the progesterone question, (laughs) that's the question that I get just constantly all the time. Many, many women struggle with this issue. It's very, very common. And it's one of the issues that most commonly shows up for women when they start charting. And so we're going to talk about it. (laughs) So I feel like a really good place to start is just jumping into what a normal cycle is supposed to look like. So we'll just go ahead and start there. So when we're thinking about what the menstrual cycle looks like when progesterone is too low, it's helpful to have a good understanding and baseline of what a healthy cycle is supposed to look like. So basically a healthy cycle is on an average of about 29 days and it can range anywhere from about 24 to 35 days. And so of course, within that, it means you could have a cycle that's perfectly healthy. That's about, you know, 32, 33, 34 days. And it also means you could have a cycle that's absolutely not healthy. That's more on the 28 day side. And so from a hormonal standpoint, a healthy cycle is characterized by sufficient estrogen in the pre-ovulatory phase, and that's a sign of good follicular development. So as your you know, ovaries are developing, the follicles are developing and they are strong and healthy. And so when they're strong and healthy, they're pumping out sufficient estrogen. That's going to trigger a good ovulation you know, around mid-cycle. So that's something to keep in mind. Once you've ovulated, then again, in a healthy cycle, you're going to have a strong luteal phase. You're going to have good corpus luteum development, and you're going to have really good, sufficient progesterone production that's within the normal range. What that looks like when you're charting is that you would have your period, and your period has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then it's going to stop. And then you're going to have um, typically a few days, which we call dry days before you start to see cervical fluid. And then as you approach ovulation, you would expect to have anywhere from five, five, six, seven days of of cervical fluid leading up to ovulation. And you'd expect to have good, strong cervical fluid production. And all that means is that you'd expect to have at least one day where you see clear, stretchy, kind of raw egg white type cervical fluid that you can stretch and you would expect to see it throughout the day. And then once you ovulate, you would expect to see that stop. And then you would expect to have what we call dry days for the rest of the cycle. So you would expect to see uh, your mucus in the window as you approach ovulation. And then once you ovulate, you would expect the progesterone production to be strong and sufficient so that it can really shut down that mucus production once you've ovulated. 
And in a healthy luteal phase, we would expect a, a minimum of 12 to 14 days. So 12 to 14 days is the length of a typical healthy luteal phase. And so from ovulation, you would expect your period to come, if you're not pregnant, 12 to 14 days after that. And during that time, in a healthy menstrual cycle with strong hormone production, both in the pre and the post ovulatory phases, so good strong follicular development, good estrogen production in the pre-ov, good progesterone production in the post-ov, we would expect you to have mild PMS symptoms, if any, so mild. We would expect, again, you to have dry days throughout the luteal phase. So uh, we wouldn't expect a whole bunch of mucus production post-off. And we would also expect to have no bleeding until you actually get your period. Just a quick overview of what the cycle looks like when your hormone production is strong. So then on the flip side, what does it look like when it's not? So, you know, today's topic is low progesterone. So what does it look like when the progesterone is too low? And so there's a few signs of low progesterone that we can be paying attention to in your menstrual cycle chart. And so these aren't necessarily all of them, but these are kind of some of the most common signs to look for. So the first is a short luteal phase. So again, the luteal phase is a period of time from ovulation until your next period. And in a healthy cycle, it's supposed to be about 12 to 14 days. So a luteal phase of 11 days or less, now I know that we could debate that. Some of you who are practitioners might debate that. 11 days is fine. I'm putting, I'm drawing a line in the sand. If the luteal phase is 11 days or less, then that uh, means that it's potentially, it's, it is on the shorter side. The second is premenstrual spotting. So spotting before your period starts and or spotting after ovulation. So if you've ovulated and confirmed ovulation, again, in a you know perfectly ideal situation when you have a healthy optimal cycle, you actually would see like if there's any spotting, it's literally like a couple hours before your period actually starts, but not for several days before your period starts. Now, I'm not saying it's not common. I'm saying that this is a sign of low progesterone. So number three, so, you know, the third sign of low progesterone on the chart would be moderate to severe PMS symptoms up to and including PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. I get a lot of questions about PMS and I've started to get more questions about PMDD. And so PMDD is severe PMS. So it's, it's basically the angry cousin of PMS. So all the things in many ways that would apply to PMS would apply to PMDD. PMDD is just more severe. There could be more to it, but generally speaking, one of the biggest factors of PMS symptoms, so premenstrual syndrome and whether that, you know, women experience it differently. So the four main categories of PMS would be anxiety. So some women feel more anxious as they approach their periods depression. So many women feel down and, and have feelings of more depressive symptoms, carbohydrate cravings. <laughs> so some of you are kind of nodding your head. So many of us find that as we approach our period, we're really craving like sugary foods, carbohydrate cravings. And then many women find that during that time, they're feeling bloated. So that categories referred to as hyperhydration, but basically having a lot of water retention and bloating. So there are different ways that women experience this. And many women experience a combination of the four kind of categories that I shared with you there. But PMS specifically, like the arc, the, the, you could call it an archetype, but basically the symptomology of PMS is that when women have moderate to severe PMS symptoms, it's characterized by an abnormal progesterone hormone arc in the luteal phase. So in a healthy luteal phase with strong progesterone production, you can basically picture something like an upside down U if we were looking at a hormone chart. So progesterone rises after ovulation gradually, peaks mid luteal, so peaks about seven days after ovulation, and then gradually comes down over the course of the remainder of the luteal phase. So you would have a gradual rise to the peak in the middle, and then you'd have a gradual drop, assuming that you're not pregnant. So what happens when for women with PMS, 
and women who are experiencing those moderate to severe symptoms up to and including PMDD is that instead of having a gradual drop over the course of like a week (laughs) in their progesterone, they often have a sharp drop or they have uh, somewhat of an atypical curve. They're not making enough progesterone. And it's that hormone imbalance. So for those of you who aren't aware, it's not like you stop making estrogen in the post-op. So before ovulation, you're making significant estrogen as those follicles are developing. But after ovulation, you continue to make a significant amount of estrogen. (laughs) It's not like you stop making estrogen. But what happens is you, uh, in a healthy cycle, you're producing significant amounts of progesterone. You produce orders of magnitude of progesterone more than estrogen in in your body. And so the progesterone is actually counterbalancing the potential effects of estrogen in the luteal phase when everything is going great. So literally PMS in and of itself is a sign of low progesterone. Okay. So then the fourth sign that I wanted to draw to your attention that you might notice on your chart or in your cycle is premenstrual mucus observations. So again, in a healthy cycle, you're making mucus as you approach ovulation because you're producing progest- uh, sorry, you're producing estrogen and the estrogen is stimulating the cervix to make all of this wonderful cervical fluid. In a healthy cycle after ovulation, again, you have a strong progesterone production in that luteal phase. And that strong progesterone production suppresses mucus because you still have significant estrogen in the post-op. One of the potential signs of low progesterone is if you still see a bunch of mucus. And again, I'm not saying it's not common. It's not uncommon. You know, many women notice some lotioning type of cervical mucus in the post-ovulatory phase or more, a little bit more mucus as they approach their period. So I'm not saying it's not common, but what I'm saying is it could be a sign of low progesterone. So just to summarize potential signs of low progesterone on your chart, you could see a short luteal phase, which I'm characterizing as 11 days or less. You could see premenstrual spotting. So some spotting before your period starts, or generally speaking, spotting after ovulation. You could have moderate to severe PM, PMS symptoms up to and including PMDD. And you may also see some premenstrual cervical fluid observations. So one thing to say is that it's typically pretty obvious. It's it's not like it's a secret. <laughs> it's not hard to find. It's not hard to see. And I think most of you who are tuning into this uh, episode, you may have chosen this episode specifically because you are seeing some of those signs and you were wondering if your progesterone is low. And because I work primarily with the menstrual cycle, there's a, a question that you know many of you might have, like, do I need to do a hormone test to confirm if my progesterone is low? And so I don't necessarily have an answer. I think that you could or you could not. This is why. If your luteal phase is nine days, your progesterone is low. Like if you ovulate and then you start bleeding, you start having your period nine days after, your progesterone is low. I don't need a test to confirm that. So how do we know it's low? Well, because if you had a healthy luteal phase of 12 days, you would have three full more days of progesterone production. So it's impossible to have normal progesterone if your luteal phase is is too short because you're literally missing out on several days of progesterone production. But with that said, there's still a lot of value to do hormone testing. What I find is that for a lot of my clients, testing their hormones and getting that actual number on a piece of paper is really what kicks them into action because now it's real. Like now we've had it verified. We've had it confirmed. I wouldn't say that it's not useful, but I'm saying that literally, like if you have those signs on your chart, that is a confirmation of low progesterone. And so you can get a test to further confirm that. And that, like I said, can often be very helpful for my clients to really jump into action. And so since I'm talking about testing, progesterone testing, I will mention how important it is to test on the correct day of your cycle. And so, you know, the vast majority of the women who I work with, if they have concerns about progesterone and they go to their doctor, their doctor is going to tell them to test their progesterone on day 21 of the cycle. And the doctor is doing that because doctors are trained to do that. They are not trained to actually get their patients to chart their cycles to understand in their minds that every single woman doesn't have a 28-day cycle and every single woman doesn't ovulate on day 14. 
And so they're kind of going with a standard that is just not realistic because most women do not ovulate on day 14 every single cycle. For you, if you are wanting to confirm your suspicions regarding progesterone and you're wanting to get a test, you do the test. (laughs) So if you're charting, you can identify ovulation in, you know, two main ways. So the first option that I'm going to recommend would be if you're charting your cervical fluid, you want to identify the last day that you have like clear, stretchy cervical fluid. That's called your peak day. And so you would want to test the progesterone on what we call peak plus seven. So seven days after peak. So if, and and you don't know that it's your peak day on the day that you see the mucus. So let me give you an example. So as I'm recording this, I'm recording this in advance, but it's actually a Friday. So I'm recording the episode on Friday. It just occurred to me. So if I had cervical fluid today that was clear and stretchy, I wouldn't know if today's my peak day because I don't know if I'm going to see it again tomorrow. But if I check tomorrow, let's say I had cervical fluid for several days and I have it today too, Friday. So let's say tomorrow, Saturday, I check my cervical fluid all day and I don't actually have any clear and stretchy, then I can look back and say, okay, yesterday was my peak day. So this is kind of basic fertility awareness confirming ovulation type of information. But basically you can use cervical fluid to help you identify when to test your progesterone in your cycle. You want to test the progesterone what we call mid luteal, in the middle of your luteal phase. It should be seven days after ovulation. So you can do the mucus thing where you can identify your peak day. And so seven days after peak, if you do your basal body temperature, so you can take your temperature every day, first thing before you get out of bed in the morning. And when you see the thermal shift, so the shift, you're looking for three temperatures that are higher than the previous six. And so you could then if, you, if you're charting your temperature, like the sixth high temperature or the seventh high temperature, that would be, you could do it like the sixth or the seventh high temperature and you're getting mid luteal. So I've just given you two strategies and if they don't match, you just do your, like if it's within a day or two, it's fine. So you don't need to like get totally granular on this, but you're still get like you're still getting mid luteal if you follow those instructions and you're still getting a much better measure of your mid luteal progesterone than if you just were to randomly do day 21. Because day 21 is assuming that you ovulated on day 14, but most women don't ovulate on day 14, some or any of the time. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful. If it sound, sound a little bit confusing, rewind that section and listen to it again, and it'll make more sense the second time. So I'm going to move forward though. So, you know, I wanted to answer that question of do I need a test? So I don't think you necessarily need one, but I think it can be helpful if that's going to help to motivate you to take action. And then we talked about how to time that. And I'll just give a shout out to, there's a previous episode that went into this whole testing thing in a ton of detail. So if you're wanting to hear more about testing on the correct day for progesterone, if this is something that you're like doing and you're wanting to make sure you do it, you know, on the correct time and everything, then just kind of scroll back. It's a bit ago. <laughs> so episode 106 with Nora Pope, uh, we talked about the progesterone in detail. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. So now I want to talk about my top strategies that I'm going to suggest to boost progesterone production in the luteal phase and normalize hormone levels. If you're struggling with moderate to severe PMS, these steps will also help to significantly decrease your PMS symptoms. Again, because PMS is not a mystery. It's not this thing that like we don't know why it happens and like it, it's not. PMS is a result of low progesterone in the luteal phase. <laughs> it's like the mystery is now gone. <laughs> and so I'm not saying it's always easy because it's not. But if you address the issues with progesterone production, what you will find is you will find a dramatic reduction of your PMS symptoms. So just to to put it out there. So from my experience working with women over the years, these are the things that I like to address first. And if you listen to last week's episode, you'll find that some of these are actually the same. But we're going to talk about them in a little bit more detail and more specific to low progesterone because last week's episode was about low BBT. So the first strategy will come as no surprise to any of my clients who work with me, which is stop skipping breakfast or intermittent fasting. If you have low progesterone 
and you have some of those signs we talked about short luteal phase, premenstrual spotting, you know, moderate to severe PMS symptoms. If you are, if you have those symptoms and you are like skipping breakfast or eating like a bagel or something for breakfast, like no protein, or if you're intermittent fasting or generally not getting enough calories a day, which I define as three meals a day with sufficient protein, fat, and carbohydrates at each meal, then it's going to be next to impossible potentially for you to actually normalize your hormone levels. Uh, There was a study that I looked at recently, which they had these women purposely consume 25% less calories than they needed day in and day out for a period of time. And they measured their hormone levels and they looked at their menstrual cycle. And what was interesting is that these women remained ovulatory. They, they, They continue to ovulate in their menstrual cycle, but their hormone levels were really low. So because they were eating 25% less calories than they required, so it was a calorie-restricted study that they were specifically looking at, they produced significantly less estradiol, which is one of the estrogens that is necessary for normal uh, menstrual cycle function, and significantly less progesterone in the luteal phase, even though they remained ovulatory. So what this means is that when we don't eat enough, even if we continue to ovulate and have a cycle, we are literally preventing ourselves from having enough energy in our body to lend itself to optimal hormone production. So if you under eat, you're just, you just cannot make enough hormones. And so there's that. So the first thing, you know, stop skipping breakfast, stop intermittent fasting and get enough overall calories, especially protein. So ladies, you want enough food. Just popping into today's episode to invite you to join my Fertility Awareness Mastery online self-study program. If you're looking for an informative and comprehensive DIY option for learning fertility awareness, I've got you covered. This program is the most comprehensive fertility awareness self-study program available. And the best part is you can learn at your own pace in your living room for a fraction of the cost of one of my live coaching programs. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash mastery for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash mastery. Now let's go ahead and jump back into today's episode. Number two, the second thing, the second strategy. So reduce or eliminate your daily coffee or energy drink because it's an appetite suppressant and it can cause adrenal issues. Uh, So yes, number three, if you're exercising three or more times a week. So if you have these low progesterone issues and you're kind of a moderate to heavy exerciser, then you've got some options. So it depends on what your goals are. You know, if you're trying to get pregnant, I know for some of my clients actually end up cutting down a little bit of their exercise, but it depends on what your goals are. So if you're not cutting down on the exercise, then you're going to have to really take a hard look at how you eat and make sure you're getting more on exercise days and getting sufficient protein every day for your activity level. And, you know, when I have this conversation with clients, one of the first comments that I often get is, well, you know, I eat all the time, I eat a lot of food and et cetera. But ultimately, it's possible to eat a lot of food and not necessarily get enough protein. And it's possible to depending on what you eat, like if, if you're not really eating protein-rich foods. So again, at every meal, there needs to be protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And if you're exercising at a really high level, you may need to consider adding in additional protein sources. So for example, adding in an additional shake that contains collagen protein or something like that alongside some fat and just make sure that you're actually getting a sufficient amount on those days. Okay, so the fourth strategy, get enough sleep a minimum of seven hours every night and sleep in the dark. Especially if you're a moderate to heavy exerciser, you may need more sleep because your body needs to heal and rejuvenate itself. Number five, address any gut issues or food sensitivities that you may have. So if you do have IBS symptoms, if your bowels are not regular, if you're not going to the bathroom every day or going to the bathroom all the time, then that's associated with inflammation. Anything that can cause stress and inflammation in the body will potentially have a negative effect on your progesterone production. So that's something, if it applies to you, it's something that you're going to want to look at and and try to really reduce that inflammation. So strategy number six is to really look at your stress. So, I mean, I could have easily said this first. I feel like it's all kind of connected, but you really want to address your stress. 
Uh, and, and that's easier said than done, you know, but you want to look at if there's any potential sources of stress in your life, whether it's um, like work related, family related, just have a have a look at that. And for many women, if I say that, they kind of know maybe maybe it's a temporary thing, like maybe they have a project that they're working on at work that's been taking up their time and it kind of is like going on for a month or something like that and then it's going to be over. And then for others, it might be like a chronic thing, like maybe you have to commute and, and the commute is really stressful on your body or whatever the case is. So stress eats progesterone for breakfast, basically. When you're really stressed in the post-ovulatory phase, we literally make cortisol from progesterone. So it, the, like literally like there's this correlation between stress and and low progesterone. So you just want to keep that in mind and think about what you can do to take care of yourself. It's a lot to have to add additional things to do, additional things to your, to your list, but you do want to really think about taking care of yourself and having some sort of stress management practice. So the last thing I'll mention is smart supplementation. So this would be strategy number seven. And again, you you probably noticed that I put the, the supplement strategy at the very end. And that's because there's certain foundational issues that uh, if you don't address them, there's a limit to how effective the supplements will be. I mean, you can take all the magnesium you want, but if you don't eat enough, it's really going to have a limited effect. Like it'll help to some degree, but you won't really get the full effect that you're looking for from the supplement itself. If you're not sleeping, if you're not getting adequate sleep or rest, Well, again, you can take all the supplements you want, but you can't out supplement sleep. Like you literally cannot stay up, you know, all night or get four hours of sleep a day and like get have sufficient progesterone no matter how much supplementing you do. So that's why they're at the end, because often we're looking for that quick fix. But what we really need to do is actually take the appropriate time to identify the um, underlying issues and do our best to start making some strides there. So in terms of supplementation, I did uh, allude to magnesium a couple times. Magnesium is well studied for PMS symptoms because of its ability to support progesterone production, particularly in the luteal phase. So certainly you can look into magnesium, you can you know supplement with it orally, you can take lots of Epsom salt baths. Uh, but typically, if you're having some challenges with progesterone production, you may find a significant improvement by adding some magnesium. Other supplements that are known to support progesterone production in the luteal phase include, you know, B vitamins, particularly vitamin B6. Even vitamin C has been shown to support progesterone production in the luteal. Vitex is one of the most popular supplements. And so certainly it's also one of the most well-studied for PMS symptoms. And so Vitex, like, you know, most herbs, it does work. It's, it's effective. It takes some time. You have to take it for, you know, minimum of about three cycles before you start seeing the results, but it does work. It does support progesterone production. But what I find is that when Vitex is the first thing you go to, then it means you don't have to address any of the other stuff. <laughs> like I, I see that a lot. You know, if you go to the Vitex, it'll work. It'll help to support your progesterone production. I would encourage you to really look at some of those other factors that could be contributing instead of going straight to the Vitex. So those are, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Another question I thought about when I was preparing for this episode was, should I get my doctor to prescribe progesterone? (laughs) Is this the approach that I should take? And I mean, that's a really good question. I feel like similar to the answer, to the answer I provided about, you know, testing, should I test? I feel like it's kind of the same thing. If you have low progesterone, like taking bioidentical progesterone is obviously a solution (laughs) that would have some effects that like it, it, it works and it does. The obvious question though is that like are you planning to take it forever? So if you have low progesterone, there's a reason. And I'm of the opinion that for the vast majority of us, our bodies are actually capable of doing what they need to do when we get out of our own way. So I mean it's it's really up to you. Again, it depends on what your goals are. Um and everyone's different. And certainly like it works because you're just adding back the progesterone that your body isn't making. But the message I hope you take from this is that your body is capable of producing sufficient hormones. Uh, Typically, what we need to do is figure out what it is that we're doing that is preventing our body from responding in the most optimal way. And when you're charting, you can take these approaches over the course of two to three cycles or more. And you will see for yourself, if you're really addressing the underlying issue, 
with the cycle, you'll really see for yourself, you know, if it works. And I think a lot of women, a lot of my clients who go through my programs are really surprised to see uh, how much genuine improvement in their cycle parameters they can they can achieve by just really monitoring some of these basic, again, foundational factors. So, so yes, you, you can, if you want to. And, but again, I would just ask the question of like, what are your goals? Do you have a time horizon? Like, can you try some of these other things first and, you know, see if they work to see if you really need to have it? And then also, are you planning to take it forever? Because if you're taking it and you never addressed why it's slow, then when you go off of it, it's not like it's going to be better. <laughs> it's, it's a medication. Like you take it and it helps the symptoms. But then when you decide to come off of it, what then? Right. So th- those are just some things to think about. And, I, and I, it, I feel like it is a practical question to ask. So to kind of review my strategies for boosting progesterone, I'll just review really briefly, was so stop skimming breakfast, eat enough food, reduce or eliminate your daily caffeine intake. You know, if you're exercising pretty moderately, moderate to heavy exercise, then ensure that you're eating more on exercise days, getting enough protein and getting enough overall energy for your activity level via your food. Get enough sleep. And make sure you're getting enough rest, especially if you fall into the exercise category and sleep in the dark. So when you're looking to improve your progesterone production, you do want a dark room at night because if it's light, it does interfere with your melatonin production, which then interferes with your body's ability to make sufficient progesterone. And so, you know, address any gut issues or food sensitivities that you have that could be causing inflammation in the body. Look to address your stress look for some of those stress reducing activities and then smart supplementation consider what you can add in to help support progesterone production and then it's up to you to decide if you want to go that route for a while or if you want to go to a uh, a different doing vitex or doing actual progesterone replacement therapy and so that kind of brings me to the end of today's topic which is low progesterone and what to do what it how it looks in the cycle how it shows up why it could be happening and what we can do to fix it so the good news here is that there's a lot of things that we can do it's not a big mystery sometimes when i hear conversations around it and get questions around it and even see a lot of resources and information around this whole topic of low progesterone it can make it seem like it's really complicated and like really hard to address i'm not saying that it's easy making changes to your lifestyle your diet and those types of things aren't always easy exercise routine, et cetera. But it's definitely doable. You know, I've, I've worked with many clients over the years and, you know, it's, you can see the changes. <laughs> That's the great thing about charting. You can track your progress and you can try something and you can see whether or not it's working. Like it's obvious if it's not working, you don't see a shift in your cycle. If it is working, you do see that shift. So there's a lot of good news here. I, I think one of the challenges is that it, it does take a bit of time. You know, it does take a couple of cycles, not forever, it certainly doesn't take like a year. It just takes a couple of cycles usually to start seeing those improvements. And within anywhere from two to three or even four, in some cases, cycles, you may actually see like a, a revolution, <laughs> a completely magnificent shift in, in your cycle beyond what you thought was possible without medication or drugs. And so hopefully the message that you take from today's episode is that your body really can do it most of the time when we get out of our body's way and we really support our body to function in the most optimal way possible. Our body kind of does the rest. When we get out of our own way, so much can happen. And so to conclude, if you are charting your own cycles and you've been running into issues with low progesterone, if you've been struggling with, you know, spotting issues with PMS or PMDD, and you've tried a bunch of stuff, but it hasn't been working for you, then I really do encourage you to consider joining us in my upcoming Fertility Awareness Mastery live group program. So in this program, not only do I provide information, a lot more depth than I'm able to do in the podcast, but it's also providing, you know, that one-on-one support. And so within the group program, there's plenty of opportunities to have individual chart reviews. There's ongoing support between calls. So there's a lot of points where we're able to have that one-on-one interaction so we can really get to the bottom of what's happening with your cycle. And yeah, so if you want more information about the upcoming Fertility Awareness Mastery live group coaching program, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam. Uh, That's fertilityfriday.com slash F-A-M. 
if you enjoyed today's episode and you know somebody who could really benefit from hearing it, then please do share. The link to share is fertilityfriday.com slash 383. And I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.